get started with our session today. Welcome everybody to Boot Coffee Campus and our um, bi-weekly webinar. I'm really excited today um, for today's session. We've been planning this for, for quite some time with my friends um, from B-Lift Coffee and the Consulate General um, of Indonesia in San Francisco. Um, we first here at Boot Coffee got to know B-Lift and Ivan specifically about a year ago when he reached out and wanted to do a tasting of their um, coffees from Java. At this point, Ivan was operating a coffee, a roasted coffee company as a social enterprise. And as we tasted these coffees, we were just blown away by um, how nuanced they were, by the acidity, by the complexity and the cleanliness of these coffees. And as we got to know Ivan and his team, um, we were also really taken by just how much information they knew about the producers and how traceable this coffee was. So that, um, that really felt like something special to us. And I think as the world has changed and even before COVID-19, um, Ivan and Kenny um, and Kevin, his partners in Java, were thinking about pivoting this business a little bit to um, adding a component of green coffee trade um, from Java to the US um, and other markets. So we're really happy to have been working with them on this initiative and happy to hear from them today. And you know, in addition to the folks from B-Lift, I'm incredibly excited to welcome um, Simon Sokarno from Indonesia, from the Consulate General of Indonesia based in San Francisco to also get an update on Indonesia and the coffee market in general and some of the initiatives that they're taking um, around the world to support and foster kind of in, an increased and renewed interest in coffee from, from that great country. A very important origin, both in the history of coffee, of course, and also in the global trade of coffee. So, you know, I would just like to give each of our speakers just one or two minutes to introduce themselves and share a little bit about their personal backgrounds before um, handing over to them to give a brief presentation, um, first from the Consulate General and then from B-Lift. So um, Simon Sakarno, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself, a little bit of general information about the work of the Consulate General um, of Indonesia here in the Bay Area and initiatives um, from, for trade? Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Simon, I'm the Consul General of the Republic of Indonesia in San Francisco. And uh, my jurisdiction, we cover about eight uh, states in the United States. And uh, my uh, priority here is to, uh, as, uh, for, of course, as first is for our citizens here, who is residing in, in San Francisco Bay Area and around the eight uh, states. We have about more than 13,000. And our second is to, uh, increase more uh, economic relations between uh, the two states. So I'm very happy to be here. And uh, my colleagues and I will talk more about the Indonesian Cafe. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're happy to have you here. Um, and then also we have our friends from B-Lift. Um, I just took this photo off of their website this morning because I loved um, this kind of close relationship that it shows in the field. Um, but you know, we have Kenny and Ivan, both from B-Lift. If you can just introduce yourselves, tell a little bit about your personal backgrounds and what brings you to this point in the coffee industry. Um, Ivan, sure. you want to get us started and then we can turn it over to Kenny? Yeah. Sure, Ivan, go ahead. Sure, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Marcus and Pat Simon for joining us and allowing us the space to, to share about the work that we do. So we started to lift in about two years ago or a year ago, give or take. And I think our mission is, is pretty simple, is that both of both Kenny and I, we grew up born, raised, came from Java. Um, and then just not seeing the, the great coffee that we've tasted back home available in the US. Uh, that just, uh, that, that is sad for us. and 
you just wanted to bring that. And as, as, as we learned more over the last year, it was a lot of just sweat and tears, right, Ken? And, and I think we learned, you know, I think this year to really bring values to the folks in the U.S., whether it's roasters, whether it's importers, coffee drinkers, on what is it that is lacking from Java, which we believe is that clarity, that traceability, and ultimately the high quality and comes in, coming in at affordable price. So, yeah, so we're, I'm excited to, to hear more from you, Marcus, or Kenny, and, and about Simon, and share about the work that we do. Fantastic. And Kenny, you have yeah. an interesting background along with your brother. Maybe you can also introduce your brother. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the third so, one able to join us. Yeah, yeah. So, hi, everyone. Thank you, um, the Consul General, Pa Simon. Marcus and everyone here. Um, so Ivan and I, we we were friends back in uh, university uh, in the U.S. And yeah, uh, as Ivan had said, we've um, we are we are coffee coffee lovers, and we just um, we couldn't believe that in the U.S. there was not really not a lot of exposure for Java coffee where we come from. So. It, we made it our personal mission then, and through a lot of learning um, and meeting a lot of farmers, and it's ultimately um, getting on the ground and doing all the dirty work with them. I mean, like uh, talking, like really um, long conversations with farmers, getting to know what their problems are, um, how they sell their coffee, how they process their coffee who do they sell it to and all of that to make us um, be able to help them and help everyone and provide good coffee for anyone looking for Java coffee in the, in the U S especially. So yeah, it's been a uh, quite a trip and we're really excited to bring more and more uh, quality and quantity to the rest of the world. Fantastic. Well, thank you. We're happy to have you all. Um, and I am i know that I'm eager for one day to hear a little bit more um, and to share with, with our listeners too, um, how exactly you're going about meeting those goals. Um, and I think you know, a good place to start with this is to hear from um, Simone and the consulate um, a little bit of background on you know where we are today with regards to the state of Indonesian coffee um, in general um, but also with regards to exports and um, the value in the U.S. We do have an international um, viewership so it'll be nice to hear a little bit of both. So um, I will turn it over to the Honorable Consulate here for for some time. Thank you Marco. Uh, colleagues at Booth Coffee uh, William Booth, Marcus Young, and all of the team, colleagues uh, at Belief Coffee, Ivan Hartanto and team, colleagues at Goodfield Coffee, Kenny Sewando, Kevin Sewando and team, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning in America and good evening in Indonesia. I sincerely hope that we all are in a good and healthy conditions despite this difficult time due to the pandemic of COVID-19. First of all, I would like to extend my appreciations to Belief Coffee to convene this webinar and invite us to participate in this discussion. I am also delighted to note the long-standing achievements and contributions of Booth Coffee as a platform of coffee education in San Francisco Bay Area, California, and in the US. I believe today's webinar is a good opportunity to put all of us together to uncover more about Indonesian coffee, one of Indonesia's champion export products. The consulate has witnessed the growing of Belief Coffee since last year, led by Ivan Hartanto, his passion to coffee and giving social impacts for coffee producers and local community has driven a lot of developments of the brand's Belief Cafe in San Francisco Bay Area, amongst all through the launching of online sellings of Belief Frosted Beans, through cafe catering services, and now the latest 
through the leaf uh, green beans. And as you all may be aware, Indonesia is the fourth largest coffee producer in the world. Everybody knows that Indonesian coffee has a lot of varieties and flavors based on the origin of the coffee in Indonesia. Historically, coffee was brought by the Dutch governor in the 17th century. The seedings originated from Yemen, were brought from India, and first planted in West Java with the name Coffee Arabica. Indonesia, which has a rich, fertile, and quality of land contour, makes coffee that grows in Sumatra, in Java, Bali, Toraja, Flores, and Papua, has the special unique taste and profile that cannot be replaced with other coffees. Therefore, I would like to encourage you to taste various kinds of Indonesian coffee. And in terms of export value, in 2019, Indonesia is the sixth largest coffee exporter to the US with a value of more than 300 million US dollars and around 104 million US dollars of export value or about 34.47% of the volume arrived at port within our jurisdictions, namely the port of Seattle in Washington state, Oakland in Northern California and Anchorage in Alaska. And as it is within our interest to promote economic and social cultural relations between Indonesia and US, I would like to see more Indonesian coffee here. Therefore, I hope that through this webinar today, you can get more insight about Indonesian coffee and inspiration to have Indonesian coffee as your collection in your cafe, roastery, office, and even at your home. And as a coffee lover myself, I'm also delighted to explore cafes in San Francisco and other cities within the consular jurisdictions that have collections and serve Indonesian coffee. During our events, such as diplomatic reception and exhibition, I'm also delighted that people are telling me how they love and enjoy the taste of Indonesian coffee. In addition, I can also say that by having Indonesian coffee, you are also contributing in the welfare of the coffee producers and farmers in Indonesia. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, there is a decreased demand for green beans, which undeniably affects the lives of coffee farmers. So let's do our part to help them. And congratulations for Belief Cafe for having your business stream, namely Belief Green Beans. And we appreciate the collaboration between Belief Cafe and of our office on promoting Indonesian coffee to various events. While wishing Belief Cafe and Good Coffee success for all the upcoming projects and missions, I hope for the fruitful discussion today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Um, a, a question, you know, when I come back a few slides and we see um, exports up some years, exports down some years, is this due to just normal agricultural cycles where you have a high yield year followed by a low yield year? Or are there other sort of economic drivers that are, that are impacting these, these swings? I mean, that's quite significant, right? From 312 um, to 290 yeah. um, million, that's a, that's a significant percentage swing. Yeah, so it's basically because of the trend of Indonesian coffee as well. Now uh, more and more Indonesian uh, becoming as well a uh, coffee enthusiast. Mm -hmm. And as you know as well, uh, coffee production as well depends on the climate and other weather. So this is uh, because of that, uh, it's the up and down of the uh, export value. But mm -hmm. now more and more Indonesian are uh, uh, becoming more coffee enthusiasts and more of the coffee producer as well now are, are uh, focusing on uh, keeping the supply for uh, the internal. Uh, in Indonesia itself, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And I'm sure that we can hear more about that from Kinney and, and some of the business that Belift is doing um, domestically back in Java with roasting and 
um, and retailing as well. So that's, I, I'm always really excited when I hear that consumption is increasing in the countries that are producing the coffee. I think it's, as you, as you said, Simon, it's important for the producers, um, but it's also, I think, equally important um, for local economies and like that level of pride. So thank you. Um, and I love the slide where you talk about what's next, because I think um, it's exciting for me as I've gotten to know B-Lift to see what they're doing and how their business interests seem to be really dovetailing and connecting with clearly some important um, initiatives from the government and how that, you know, the kind of public interests can support um, private enterprise and vice versa. So thank you so much. And I think, um, you know, from here it makes sense to hand it over to, to B-Lift. And we heard a little bit about their, their personal backgrounds, but I'm really keen for um, the team here to share a little bit more about what B-Lift is. Um, especially, I think, um, Ivan and Kenny, I'm excited to hear how you all think of B-Lift really doing something different and unique from other suppliers of green coffee in Indonesia that, that are currently in the, in the field. The, the floor yeah. is yours. Okay, uh, so um, what's, what's our strength in B-Lift is that um, we are on both sides. So Ivan is our um, more of a business growth and buyer specialist to cater to the needs of um, US-based customers. And Kevin, my brother, um, is the quality uh, control part. So he's a certified Q Arabica grader. So any samples that we have from the farmers here in Indonesia, we will send to my brother and we'll get it sample roasted and just cupped. And then we provide feedback to the farmers and then I, um, I push that information back to Ivan so that any buyers can have a really, really fast response in getting any information and updates. And my part is specializing in meeting the farmers themselves, um, creating long lasting and um, um, beneficial relationships for both parties and how we can take Indonesian coffee, speci specifically Java coffee, to the next level. Because um, um, in the past years, Indonesian coffee, um, it's been growing rapidly uh, in terms of quality and, and also the demands are shifting towards domestic trends. Um, a lot of coffee booths opening up and coffee stands in, in the nation. So it's, re it's a really good time for the farmers and we're here to um, help elevate that too. Right, and can you, can you share just a little bit about your other um, business interests there in Indonesia with roasting and- Yeah, yeah, sure. So brother Kevin, he's QC, he's a Q grader, he's a barista competitor, he plays in a lot of these realms and, and you're very deep in that side as well. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, so aside from this green beans um, um, thing that we are trying to do um, is that we also sell roasted beans in the domest uh, domestically through online. And also we sell to a lot of coffee shops and cafes. So when I meet the farmers, then it's, it's a really good, good relationship because we also sell to the domestic and we sell internationally. So, um, and also domestic consumption um, with all of its uh, variability can, can sometimes be um, a little bit challenging for the farmers sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we, we also help them with um, like um, special um, advice for, for them to manage their schedules and how to process coffee better. Okay. No, that's great. And I think how, when, when you think about, you've, you've been here in the Bay Area, and when you think about yeah. cafe and the, the customers and the coffee scene there in Indonesia, um, it might just be what you're tasting in the cup, or it could be the design and things. How, yeah. how much 
does what you're doing there have with what you saw with the coffee scene in the U.S., the kind of third wave cafes? Um, the, the differences? Uh, the differences or the similarities? Um, the similarities um, that the, the coffee shops and cafes, both in Indonesia and in the Bay Area, both, uh, all of them try to have their own unique identities uh, from the interior design aspect and then from their coffee. So um, some specialize in just cheap coffee, um, coffee milk, um, there's this trend called uh, coffee milk um, booths. So people just sell coffee milk, uh, coffee with milk at a very, um, very affordable price. And then there's the other region of the market where they sell uh, at a premium price. Um, it's a real, it's a real specialty coffee shop. And both use, use different coffee beans um, and they try to outcompete each other, which is also like in the Bay Area where um, you have a lot of competition between all the coffee shops and everyone's just trying to have their own identities right. and, and their own uh, genres of coffee. One coffee shop likes to have it uh, more towards um, lighter roasted coffee. The other one is more towards darker roasted coffee and they have their own customers. Right. And I think in the Bay Area, it's more alive because of um, it's a wealthier economy. So people can afford it much more than in Indonesia. But in Indonesia, it's, it's uh, growing rapidly too. Cool. Yeah, I, I mean, I just wanted to ask that and, you know, we'll get more into your green coffee business. But I think it, it makes your company quite unique because in some ways you are operating a cafe with a, with a customer base and with the qualities of coffee that are pretty aligned, I think to what US, European, um, other Asian buyers kind of in the global north um, yeah. are familiar with, right? And boy, having somebody on the supply side that understands yeah. um, the business of a quality focused coffee roaster, I think is a quite, is a, is a quite unique angle and it becomes a pretty valuable piece of the puzzle um, for a supplier looking for a roaster looking for a supplier bringing yeah. something unique. Thank you. Um, and Ivan, what do you what would you like to share just kind of generally about who you are, B Lift as a company, since you're bringing the um, U.S. side of the of the equation here. You're the 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 boots on the ground representing, and you're in the U.S. Right? Yeah. Uh, so I think to add what Kenny said, which I echo everything. Right. I think it's a difference. Different different world, that's for sure. Uh, but it's, I think it's very promising though, Marcus, because um, like when you're here and when, because I get the opportunity to work directly or even talk directly with the potential buyers, the end users a lot of times, right? Like um, just visiting a blue bottle or a glitter, talking to people here and there. Like, I think it's, it's it really helps us shape the values that we need to bring, right? And I think that's what Kenny put in the slide here. Like, you know, I think the four values that we really highlights are the traceability, the quality, and the consistency and the trans and the consistency and, and the reliability, right? What I what I realized after talking with a lot of just coffee experts in the Bay Area, whether it's side glass, whether it's you, whether it's like consumers, importers, um, I think there is a gap between Indonesian coffee producers, namely the farmers and then the roasters. And if I, if I might like share my thoughts here, I think it's, it's even like, I think it stems from the language markets, right? When let's say U.S. buyers, let's say you, you go to Colombia, or at least the U.S. buyers go to Colombia, there might be a connection there with the language, both speak the same language, like Spanish. And then if you go to, let's say, Africa, like Kenya, for instance, right? Um, maybe some people speak French. Whereas when you visit Indonesia, there is no 
I suppose um, no no language connection there. And especially in the specialty coffee, right? Like it's all about trust. So, so it's really hard to build that trust. And, and that's before the whole difference in culture, right? Like when you go to like new country, it's a, it's a whole different culture. Um, so that's, that's what we see is, is lacking. And that's where Belith fills in. Um, like Kenny said, we exist in both continents. We learn firsthand from the buyers. I then just chat Kenny and then Kenny would then go to the farmer, share that knowledge, right? And then like that, that cycle of, of, of innovation is very fast. And where we were last year is so different than where we are right now. And all these things that you see in, in the slides here are truly purely like coming in from the demand of the market here in the US. Mm -hmm. um, like we didn't have transparency in our value last year we thought like an 82, 83 coffee is good enough, you know, now it's all changed, right? We want to be 100% transparent. As you can see there, that's a photo that Kenny himself took when he visited the farm. Um, we're aiming always for like the high, high quality coffee, like 84, at, we're aiming above 85 actually, so that people can highlight it as single origin, or at least the Bay Area and, you know, coffee shops, if they, if they chose to, they can highlight it as single origin. And, you know, working on the logistics side as well, making sure that it's reliable. We do a lot of, uh, we have our own exporting license. We have our warehouse in Indonesia. So I think it just really, we're the extension of buyers, right? Like how, how we can add value to this. Um, and on the above that, since I'm here, like we're also building connection directly with the roasters or the coffee shop, the coffee houses. And, and I think it's very exciting to see like, we actually found the good coffee that is affordable and transparent or traceable, which if it's, if I told people last year, people wouldn't believe me. Like you can't find an 85 Java that is traceable. Mm -hmm. And I think we made that happen. And the three farmers that we highlight in our project here is are, are based on like those quality and criteria. So I think it's very exciting to see what we can do this year. Yeah, I think it, it is something really different. And as someone who's been a buyer, both for an importing company and who's bought coffee for a number of different roasting companies, um, often the, the challenge with Indonesian coffee is that transparency, that traceability. It's, it's for too many years, it seemed like the more questions I would ask and the deeper that I would get into a relationship with an exporter, the more opaque everything became. Um, a number 100%. of years ago, I was trying to set up a, a supply of coffee um, from Sumatra, in this case, and we would identify a supplier. We thought that we could really, you know, get to the bottom of what was important for us as a company. We would book plane tickets and have trips ready to go, kind of start building this relationship. And, you know, those trips were all canceled because as the questions got harder, the answers became more obtuse. Um, and so I like, and I think, you know, this is a good chance to bring Kenny back into the conversation um, or is to um, talk about, you know, how you're actually obtaining this transparency and what your data collection looks like. There was actually a question through on chat about traceability by using QR codes and other things. So I think, I think the questions are related you know, what, what, what is the process like when you're setting off to start working with a farmer? How do you get answers to these questions that you're asking, like fair wages, reasonable hours, environmental conditions? And then, of course, the data collection piece and actually tracking that coffee that you're purchasing, maybe as, you know, this photo shows cherries drying on a bed all the way through a bag that's ready to export. So I know that's yeah. a big worms that I open, but I'll, I'll hand it back to you. No, 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 it's okay. Uh, so finding farmers who we can have relationships with um, is definitely not easy. So we, we meet them in, a, in many different places. So um, the Argopura one in East Java, in the picture you're, uh, we're all seeing now, 
Uh, they specialize on their natural process coffee because uh, there's a story of um, water shortage in their village and uh, the coffee plantation, the, the coffee farm uh, was just struggling with a uh, washed job, wash, washed process because there wasn't too much water. So they, they focus on that. But yeah, um, finding the farmers. The first one is um, um, it's, it's, it comes from a lot of places. So Argopura, we, we met him. Uh, so his name is Pat Mulisin. He, um, we met him when we purchased green beans for uh, our roastery ourselves back in 2016, I think. Yeah. Um, and then um, the second one is uh, Tamangung from Central Java. We met him at a fair. We were, we were invited to this fair in Jakarta and we just like coincident, coincidentally met him and um, he happened to be very uh, supportive of our ideas and it's just, just a match. Um, it's sometimes weird how we, we get to find these farmers who, who are willing to work closely with us and just uh, are really ter terrific people. And um, so for the traceability part, um, it's, um, I don't think we, we need to use QR code for now, I think. Um, so the process is the farmers harvest their beans they they notify us, and then if it's not if it's not COVID pandemic, we usually do visits to the farm, and then we get the samples, and then we cup them, and then we grade them and see how things are going, both in the coffee quality and their their back end, um, so their processing, their machinery, how they. Um, how they sort their coffee and all of that. So uh, again, coffee is uh, a really long chain of people working together, right? And it's um, it's uh, it's really a holistic view on how 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 to identify the problems and where where we can tackle the problems. So um, so for traceability, we 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 are one hundred percent committed to always always um giving the complete information to buyers so where exactly the farm is where the where the farmers live where the farmers are and we ask the farmers a lot of questions like um do the pickers come from the local area local village or do they like um outsource them are the community in the village involved in this um, usually the women in Indonesia um, they have this um, duty or uh, the job of uh, sorting the, the coffee and the guys usually pick the coffee and the farmers uh, like Pa Mulisin they pay the he, he pays the pickers and then um, and and yeah, we all, we all we only work with farmers who who are um, who are not not too big in size. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing to be um, like having a big capacity, but we we start with me, a mid sized coffee farm to make sure that we can uh, work together and mold everything in in the direction that we want that is uh, fair wages to the pickers good coffee continuous developments and also yeah being in being there for the long term Great. yeah yeah I think um, it, it's often easy to sort of ask for traceability and transparency yeah and yeah, yeah it may be social sustainability but um, the data collection is a major part right because you probably yeah do. yeah what are they paying their pickers today versus two months from now at the end of the harvest? And how does that compare to last year? Or what does the yeah. next look like, right? And, yeah, and, yeah. and you know, it can be frightening for a business like a farm and equally frightening for you guys if, if a buyer yeah. says, hey, I really want this to be transparent. I want to know what margin you're taking. 
And yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, adding, you know, how are you more than just a middleman? Um, yeah, yeah. And I think you know, we have a great question in chat here, which is um, how do you guarantee your end client, which would be either an importer that you're facilitating a sale to or a coffee roasting company, how do you guarantee where the coffee came from? And how can that client ultimately trace that coffee back? I mean, I think that, that has been the, the fear and sort of the reluctance of a lot of like direct trade buyers to do to yeah. get to Indonesia, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how, so how first, I think uh, first, we just give the complete information. Um, uh, a lot of coffee exporters are afraid to give uh, their complete information, like where the farmer is and where where they live and all of that, because um, they they're scared of people bypassing them. But we we don't really have that fear because we work really closely and we build uh, great trust with them, and then um, we we identify where they are and just put put it all on a label and we we give all the information to the buyers and they can they can always compare the samples that we send and the the coffee that they get at the other end and, and it shows that we we don't really uh we own we always give the 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 real thing <laughs> so right i mean at, at some point there's an element of trust that has to come into play with your yeah yeah um, a lot of you know, trust. and I think it's different in Java and especially with the estate farms that you're working with um, these are operations that are handling their post-production processes well as well right so they're not only yeah. harvesting the coffee maybe buying from some outlying farmers um, but they're also handling yeah. as the photo shows the drying um, or the pulping and drying for a washed or a wet hold coffee, um, yeah. which is, um, you know, smaller farmers in somewhere like Sumatra, where they might just be selling to an intermediary on the road who trucks those yeah. coffee all across the country, um, and then they just get sold as a to yeah. walk they were grown somewhere. It all, it all gets mixed together and 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 something like that, right? Exactly. So I think you know, it, it does speak to your ability on the ground. Yeah, yeah. So we, we find the farmers and we, we have to be strict on um, uh, verifying that they actually really do. Their, they are actually in control 100% of their uh, production. Even though it's a village and you can have uh, like a lot of maybe like three or four farmers there, uh, we have to make sure that we know their processing is real, is real, and we know where the coffee uh, is grown. We we make sure that they take us there, and we ask the pickers directly in harvest seasons because because we speak the language. Uh, we speak Javanese, so it's um, it's a straight connection and no translation. And we we ourselves are. Uh, we we grew up here and we know that their their wages are fair um, because uh, the way we gauge the fairness of the wage here is uh, a combination of comparing it to the minimum wage, which may or may not be uh, sometimes like sufficient for a picker or a farmer to sustain himself. But uh, we also combine that with um like um the local wage in that area and over time uh in the longer term relationship that we are building it shows um that they're not exploiting the farmers or the pickers mm -hmm. and we we sometimes hear stories of uh surrounding areas being um they they call it the, the farmers call it being bombed by uh, like a, because the, the there are huge corporations, um, commodities corporations in Indonesia, and they they export on a massive massive scale, and one of the the evil strategies that they do is they um, bomb an area by buying the cherry for let's say twice the price this year, 
So that shuts down all the uh, local farmers in that area because mm -hmm. they cannot afford to pay the, farm the pickers twice, twice the wage. And then uh, after the farmers all shut down or like are severely hurt, uh, then the next year they only pay half because there's no other option for the pickers because the farmers already died out. So it's really, it's really bad. So we just have to, uh, whenever we visit a farm and it's not always simple because we have to verify their production and the, the fairness starts from like just talking to people, the, the pickers and just, um, I know it's, it's not a um, hundred percent like uh, a straightforward answer, but over a long term, it, it's, it always shows that if, if a farmer is, um, it's not paying fair wages to their pickers. Right. So, yeah. And I think, you know, and the, and the other piece of that is um, the transparency on VLIFT as a company too, right? Because yeah, yeah. as another question came through chat about what do you mean by paying a fair price for the coffee and how, yeah, yeah, yeah. how is that different from what your competitors might pay? And I think on the one hand, the answer is what you just gave. You wouldn't yeah, have yeah. blue coffee if somebody was buying, paying more for it. But the other is probably documenting that and being willing to open up that portion yeah. as well. Um, because some buyers are going to really care about that. Yeah, yeah. That's the function of, of, of myself here in Indonesia to verify, even though it's a slow and lengthy process, it's, uh, it's a necessary thing to do. So. Right. Yeah, and, it's, and I think it, it is challenging when you're looking not just for um, a third party yeah. sort of thing, but I mean, the benefit of rainforest alliance or a oops or a fair trade is that there's a third party verifying that. And if yeah. you're setting up that yourself and maybe to go beyond what those labels offer, boy, it puts a big workload on you for that, just for the data collection verification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, thank you. And, um, and I think, you know, this, this slide which you shared also brings up another, you know, strong point of your team that we've already talked about, but your kind of in-house, in-country, team and, and, you know, and for me, it's you all are a, a, a green coffee startup, but you're bringing both experience and resources that you would expect from a much larger company. Um, you know, many importing companies have kind of an office, a trade arm in the countries that they're sourcing from in order to do just this type of work. And the fact that you're able to do this all in house and um, as you both have said, you're, you're from there, you speak the language, you know the culture, yeah traditions um, is is really a strong point to to the model because it's not like I would have to set up a full supply yeah and um, we've talked a little bit about the coffees but you know I I love seeing these flavor notes because it reminds me of now cupping these coffees last season yeah and yeah <laughs> some of my some of my own notes and some of Willem's notes here as well um, and yeah, it brings back such fond memories of these coffees. But can you share maybe just, uh, you know, we're, we're have about 10 minutes left. So just share a little bit about um, each coffee and then we'll let people know how to get a hold of you and ask some more questions. Yeah, 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 sure. So maybe start with uh, the Argopuro one. I think it's just, that's the first one or uh, okay. Java. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, Pak Mulisin or Mr. Mulisin, um, he lives uh, about three and a half hours away from this place, uh, Surabaya, my city. And um, we met him when we were purchasing green beans for our roastery, which was uh, a lot sm smaller back then, 2016. And then um, we, after um, I worked together with Ivan and we have B-Lift, and we we started to um, focus more and more on the relationship and yeah it, it has been really really good um, his coffee has improved a lot in quality um, I think um, if you I think you cupped them last year right uh, Marcus or yeah I think these these flavor notes are, are yeah, yeah, yeah yeah I think they're yeah, yeah. I think it's even better this year. Um, 
Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I'm so excited because um, when the green beans shipment arrived from like the sample, because they have they still have one month to go in harvest season right right now. Um, the the harvest season is uh, like one month, one month uh, about one month late this year, but it's it's still one month left. So they're constantly processing and the samples when they come in, it's wow, it's just like this fruity smell and it's, when we cut them, it's 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 amazing. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So a producer like this, right? He's doing natural copies. Um, yeah. Three tons, so you know, reasonable capacity, right? A container and a half. Um, are there like micro lots from that, or is it just kind of all one um, agroporo coffee, or are they separating varieties or separating um, different harvest periods? What what's the variation from one farm like this? Yeah, yeah. So Pamulis in in uh, in Argopuro started um, planting these coffee trees back in two thousand, I think early two thousands. And when the market wasn't really that big for uh, domestic coffee consumption in Indonesia. And then over time in 2017, 18, started booming. And the, the seeds that he got back in early 2000 came from the agricultural ministry. Um, they have a subsidy thing program back then, which was a mixed um, variety. But then with the boom and with this coffee boom in Indonesia and also um, many more countries in the world adopting a coffee lifestyle, uh, I explained to Pak um, Mulisin that we would need to have um, to elevate more of the, the varieties, the special varieties in the, in the, uh, in the farm that, we, that he has. Um, he has some bourbons. Um, and other varieties that uh, need to be isolated because uh, it, it will contribute a lot to um, like increasing quality because uh, with mixed variety, sometimes it's always an issue of when, when uh, roasters roast them, um, some, some varieties, they take the heat this way, some right. varieties do like, and it all gets mixed up. So it's like a normal distribution curve, but it's like all messed up. Uh, Are you providing so, yeah. advice, kind of technical assistance just as kind of a cost of doing business or is that another, um, how, how, how do you sort of advise farmers in this, in this way then? What, what is your, what role does your lab there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first, first step is listening to them and just asking them um, how many varieties uh, are there and how, how can we take this to the next level. And uh, finally, um, after discussing uh, with Pak Mulisin, he actually, um, they implemented this, they, they um, have bought the seeds for uh, Yellow Katura and they're starting to plant it um soon i think yeah so it's it's it, it may be like a few years uh four four years from now five years from now until they start to produce coffee but it'll be a a very special moment when when they have a single single variety thing going on there awesome yeah but i think yeah that's a i mean that's a huge value because you know when you look at your other producers yeah Mr. Sonano, there's a hundred tons, so a much bigger farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing like sun dried washed coffees, things that maybe, you know, a lot of um, at least US based coffee folks haven't tasted a lot of. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. In Indonesia, it also, um, like this. Yeah, yeah. It's also due to the fact that the bureaucracy back in 2018. Um, was changed by the by the president and the the cabinet back then. It it used to be that the co coffee exporting license is only given uh, if you can export a hundred tons of green coffee per year, mm -hmm. which is um, pretty ridiculous. Because how can you start exporting green coffee 
if if you're only given that license if you can export 100 tons of coffee <laughs> so it's it's like um it's a remnant from the past um, more um backwards bureaucracy so they they're lifting that in 2019 and uh, since then um we have this opportunity because we have the exporter license ourselves and we can directly get the farmers get information from ivan in the us and get the information from the farmers rally back and forth improve quality improve quantity improve consistency and uh, listen to the buyers listen to the farmers and just give the best coffee possible and um, giving benefit to all parties in the chain so yeah that's that's what we're really uh, passionate about actually I'm sure as well, Marcus, to, to add to what Kenny said. Like this one is more special to me. Not to say that I don't love the Argopura. This one is <laughs> three hours away from my from my where I grew up. Whereas Argopura was like I think five hours away from where Kenny grew up. Yeah, yeah. But if you look at this one, Marcus, one thing that I would really like to highlight here is look at the altitude of the mountain. How often do you see like a nineteen hundred meter like coffee from Java? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something else. That is truly something else. And, and I think the, this coffee just blew my mind how like it, if you look at the notes, it's more of that citrusy, leafy, like t- a coffee, um, tea-like, black tea-like flavor. Mm. Still has that fiber acidity. And, and to me, like this doesn't look like Indonesian coffee, or at least the one that I usually would, you know, relate to. Um, so yeah, I, I think between these two coffee, there are two very distinctive coffee. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's amazing. Uh, and um, all of these coffees, you know, here's the, the third one that you wanted to share with us, but um, they're, yeah. they're so unique because they, and when I cupped them, they, you know, in some ways they had a little bit of like a core or an essence of my stereotype of coffee from Java. Um, but you're also kind of, I think, showing and challenging the perceptions of that terroir mm-hmm. um, by working with these farmers that really are taking additional care. And you know, mm-hmm. in some ways, I feel like when tasting these coffees, it was it was really the first taste that I really ever had of the potential of coffees from from Java because there wasn't this kind of noise of like wood and earth and um, and maybe less than careful processing getting in the way. Um, and here, right, here's a lower grown coffee, but a coffee from yeah. a female producer as well. So. Yeah, and every farmer is in a different kind of phase. And um, Subang coffee, uh, the farmers there are, um, they have been doing very like, very good work even before we jumped in so they have their own like proper nursery set up and uh, they separate only they only grow typica variety so it's all it's only single variety which is really really good <laughs> but for the rest of the farmers we have to steer them in a way i know it's not it's not like it's not pleasant to have too many varieties mixed in but uh, those farmers are the ones that really need our help because um, they they are kind of stuck with it to to, to say the least. Right. But they they can they can change the future slow, slowly but surely. Yeah. Right. And your willingness to I think you know work of course kind of focused on these high end coffees that everybody's excited about. But it's great to hear that you know the the success of a business and the success of these producers also hinges upon being able to find homes for their maybe higher volume, yeah. slightly lower quality, and maybe more sort of classic Java profile coffees, right? Yeah. That's great. Well, just, you know, as we, as we wrap up here, um, oh, yeah. we can just watch this video of these naturals going out to dry. We just have yeah, to, yeah. But, um, I just want to, go ahead. This video is taken like um, I think two weeks ago by Pat Molisin. So he's showing like um, another batch of naturals being dried and all of that. Oh, and I I, uh, I forgot to mention that 
um, during this COVID-19 pandemic, the, the national government, uh, the central government actually cared and they, um, they have this um, company, state owned company of, um, it's called, if it's translated as um, agricultural company, I know. Um, but they, the central government injected a lot of money into that company to buy all the cherries that, that don't get picked, um, that, that would not have been picked this harvest season. So that's a really big thing because uh, of all the pickers get, still get the money, still get a living wage from the government. So big, big thumbs up to the government. Even though the demand is low for green coffee in Indonesia, they, they still care about um, paying, paying these picker, this pickers. Very cool. Well, um, you know, you have some other slides, just logistics details, but it's really just showing that you all are following some best practices. Yeah. Um, so, you know, really, I want to just wrap up by encouraging everybody who might be interested um, in learning more or connecting with Ivan and Kenny um, to understand deeper. Or, if, of course, if you have a commercial interest, that's great, too. Um, but you can reach them at beliftgreenbeans.com. Um, and here's their email addresses and phone numbers as well. Um, of course, you can also email me, Marcus, at rootcoffee.com. Um, if, you, if you have any questions, um, and I'm very happy to facilitate introductions as well if it's someone who knows me better, because I'm really excited about what you all are doing. And um, I think this is our first webinar where we've kind of just really focused deeply on one group and one origin. So I appreciate yeah. you, everybody. Any, um, any last questions? 24 seven. <laughs> Great. Well, yeah, they, they are very responsive yeah. to, to that. So, um, I think with that, thank you everybody for joining us. This was a really fun um, session for me today. And um, Rachma just asked if we could share the presentation and 100% we can. And we will also share um, the recording of this entire session um, at coffeecampus.com slash blog and also on our social media. So it takes me a little bit of time to download the files and convert them and post them, but we'll get those up soon. So thank you, everybody. Have a great yeah, Thursday everyone. of your week tomorrow. Bye.